Peace be to this house. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church and School for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Just a couple of announcements before uh, the beginning of service. Um, In the pews, there are these little white cards. Um, I invite you to fill those out. It it denotes your attendance um, here today. Um, It just helps us uh, care for this congregation, um, the people that regularly gather here around God's word and sacraments. Um, So I uh, ask you to please do that. Um, As you uh, are probably aware, um, the little guys are singing today uh, here. um, And following the service, um, we invite uh, everybody to attend. We'll have a little bit of a brunch um, after the service and and all are welcome to to partake and and get some some good brunch food. Um, Are there any other uh, particular announcements needing to be made this morning? All right. Well, with that, I then invite you to rise and greet one another and share the peace of Christ. Please turn in the hymnal to page 167 for Divine Service Setting 2. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro it. The intro it is found printed in your bulletin. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty. God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing Plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads 
and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite the boys and girls to come forward for a children's message. Good morning, friends. It is great to see all of you here. I'm looking forward also to hearing the second and third graders sing. So just for a second, think about your favorite sweet. Maybe a candy bar, maybe a kind of pie. Something that's sweet that you like to eat. Now I ask you a question. Would you rather have half of that or the whole thing? Raise your hand if you'd rather have just half of it. Really? It's very surprising to me. Raise your hand if you'd rather have the whole thing. Well, that's what I expect. Put your hands down now, friends. Boys and girls, the Word of God doesn't bring us half a message, but a whole message. Today's epistle comes again this week from Philippians, this time chapter 4. And here, Paul teaches several wonderful whole messages. Paul tells Christians to rejoice. But that's not all that Paul says. That would be only half the message. Paul tells Christians to rejoice in the Lord. Another one. Paul reports that he can do all things. But that's not all Paul says. That would be only half the message. Paul reports that he can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through Christ. And then, and this is what I want to focus on today, Paul tells Christians not to be anxious. Now again, that's only half the message. And we'll get to the other half in a second. But first of all, what does it mean to be anxious? Second graders or younger, you might not know that word. I'll bet your third graders do. You got, what does it mean to be anxious? Jaja? Um, uh, sort of. What were you going to say, Jaja? Aha, uh-huh, we're getting close now. Yeah, right. Scared, she said. Another word for it? Yep. I forgot it. You got idea? Yeah? Worried. Yeah, I had, I had thought of scared or worried or, or nervous about something. Yeah, that's what anxious means. Now, lots of things can make us feel anxious, like homework and tests and uh, projects and a lot of things in school. We can get anxious when we're not getting along with a friend. Or maybe at home, people aren't getting along at home, and that can make us anxious. And we can be worried and scared about how things are going to turn out. Sometimes we can get anxious about crime in our community or war in our world. When people get anxious, they often show it by their Uh, actions by their body language. You know what I'm talking about. There's a face that's an anxious face, right? It looks maybe something like my face right now, right? An anxious face. The face looks concerned. Muscles may twitch. Knees may knock. Some people bite their fingernails. But Christians have a better way to deal with tough stuff and life's problems. Hey, guys, here's the other half of God's message. We have a Savior who loves us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. He loves us. He loves us so much, he humbled himself to death on a cross for us, and he took our sins away. Moreover, he's not dead anymore. Now he's alive ever since Easter Day, living and reigning. 
Paul in Philippians 4 says the Lord is at hand. That means the Lord is near. The Lord is here for you. And so here's the other half about anxiety and worry and being scared. Every day, we Christians have some place to go or we have somebody to go to when we're feeling anxious. We go to God, our Father in heaven, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. No better place to go. What do we call that when we often do this, or sometimes Christians do this, or even this? What do we call this? Pray. That's right. Prayer is simply talking to God. Do you get to do that? Yes, and so do I. He will hear us and he will answer us. Paul writes, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, and supplication means asking God for the things we need, also asking him for other people for the things they need. Paul says, With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So thanks be to God. He gives us a whole message. Rejoice, he says, in the Lord. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And finally, do not be anxious, but rather pray. So let's do that right now. Please fold your hands. Dear Heavenly Father, when you sent your Son to die for us, you showed us that you truly love us sinners and that we may always rely upon you. When life is difficult, teach us that you are eager to hear our prayers and to answer in the way that is best. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. We'll sing the hymn of the day.
your friends in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text is the gospel reading. Last Sunday, Pastor Doley began his sermon noting that a very important question to ask ourselves upon hearing or reading the Holy Scriptures is, how does this text apply to me? Or to put it in other words, what is God saying to me in this text of Scripture? It is necessary to hear and read the Scriptures with care so that we can arrive at correct conclusions about what God is saying to us. For God has given His Scriptures and He has instituted preaching in His church so that God's people might hear from His servants those messages and truths, those warnings and promises that God intends for His people. Pastor Doldy reminded us last week that in Matthew's Gospel, the 21st and the 22nd chapters include several parables of Jesus which the Lord addressed very specifically to the Jewish religious authorities of His day. Last week, we heard the parable of the vineyard owner and his tenants. And this week, we hear the parable of the king and the guests whom he has invited to the wedding feast of his son. In both parables, and these are very disturbing parables, there are shocking displays of arrogant disregard and contempt for those in authority followed by judgment against those who have acted so wickedly. As Jesus Christ, during what we call Holy Week, he told these parables in the days just before his crucifixion. As Jesus in Holy Week told these parables, the Lord's message was one of sharp rebuke to his enemies among the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus challenged them, who were bent on destroying him, to yet change course even at this late hour to repent and to believe in him. Now today I will declare to you how the parable of the wedding banquet applies to you. But before doing so, there's something that must be brought into this sermon for just a bit and then kept in its proper place. It's the news of our world. This week, the news has been dominated by events in the state of Israel, where one week ago, Hamas militants from Gaza bombarded Israeli towns, then broke through a border fence and proceeded to attack and kill Israeli civilians, also taking many hostages, as I'm sure you all know. Counterattack by Israel has followed, and a ground invasion by the Israeli military into Gaza is, I think, expected very soon. Now, news of war in any corner of the world should get people's attention and should arouse their concern, in particular, Christians who take seriously Jesus' command that we love our neighbor, and that means all other human beings, as we love ourselves. News of war in the modern-day state of Israel is always particularly alarming because of how volatile that region of the world has historically been, and especially so since the forming of the modern-day state of Israel in 1948. We ought to pay attention to the unfolding news about the state of Israel and her neighbors in these days, and we ought to be concerned about the welfare of all the people involved, and as I was saying in the children's message, then above all, pray. According to our office as royal priests of God, we ought to pray for all those involved. We also ought to pray for our nation's leaders to be given all needed wisdom in the exercise of their God-given duties in relation to our nation's ally, Israel. And we ought to pray for the United States citizenry, among whom there are clearly some divides about U.S. support for Israel, that God would grant to us civil stability, especially in those places where protests have emerged. So all of these are proper Christian responses to war in general and in particular to the war that is now happening. What we must, however, guard ourselves against is being misled by Christian preachers who in these days 
may be making unbiblical assertions about the significance of these Middle East events. Many of our brethren in Christ, having a love for God's Word and a very commendable desire to do God's will, with the very best of intentions, promote false understandings of biblical prophecy, in particular about the end times. These Christian teachers claim to draw from the Scriptures in particular prophetic books like Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation, the message that the modern-day state of Israel plays a pivotal role in the coming end times. Many of these people hold to some version of a millennial doctrine, that is, a teaching that Christ will return to earth and reign over the nations on earth from Jerusalem for a literal period of 1,000 years. Now, these very passionately held and very well-meaning and sincere interpretations of Scripture are simply incorrect. They do not do justice to the centrality of Jesus Christ in the Scriptures and in God's plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile alike. These teachings fail to keep Christians' eyes on the exalted Christ who rules and comforts his church through word and sacrament right now, and who will come again once and suddenly on a day which only God knows to judge the living and the dead. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, so if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So dear friends, we Christians should love our neighbor. We should boldly bear witness to the gospel. We should pray for our leaders and urge them towards sound courses of action through our voices and through our votes. But we Christians should not fear or dread world events of any kind, but should trust steadfastly in Jesus Christ, all the while fervently and boldly praying in the Spirit as we joyfully live out those callings in which God has placed us for the benefit of our neighbor. After all, Jesus Christ is the victorious, reigning Lord. God has given Jesus the name that is above every name, as Paul said in Philippians 2. Jesus is the Son of God, the great King. And Jesus is the bridegroom who bought his church with his own blood so that his people could take part in his glad wedding feast. And friends, no power, not human or demonic, can change that. So, tranquil hearts, God's people. Tranquil hearts. Jesus is Lord. And that leads us back into the parable and what that parable means for us. The parable of the king and his son and the invitations to the wedding banquet. When we consider this parable, what stands out to us especially is, on the one hand, first of all, the figure of the great king who has a son who is getting married and who has prepared a feast in honor of his son, and moreover, who has the desire that his subjects share in the celebration of the marriage feast of his son. The king in the parable is no weak figure. In all things, he acts with firm resolve and purpose. Nor, however, is the king a cruel figure, a tyrant. Friends, here is a king who, when his subjects at first refuse his invitation, imagine that, he suffers himself to be thus insulted by them and turns around and invites them again. Yes, as Jesus says at the end of our text, many, that is, the many, in other words, all, are called and called again. On the other hand, what also stands out in this parable is the brazen audacity of the subjects of the king. Not content to spurn the king's initial invitation, 
these subjects turn up their noses at the king a second time, some even raising violent hands against the king's servants. Moreover, among the company of those bad and good subjects who are ultimately gathered there to sit at the wedding banquet in the latter part of our text, among them, at least one, the man not wearing a wedding garment, displays the same sort of disregard for the honor of the king and his son. Yes, sadly, as Jesus also said, few, that is to say not all, are chosen. What we discover in this parable is that many figures are found to be despising the goodness and the generosity of the king. His gracious banquet invitation and the noble name of the king's son. I mean, you can be sure that this wedding would be, this feast would be beyond all uh, measure, opulent and wonderful. Yet they despise it. They look down upon it. They consider it something insignificant. All these figures in the parable were portrayed in this way by the Lord Jesus in order that he might deliver a stern warning. Now remember, he told this parable in particular to speak to his opponents among the Jewish religious leaders of his day. He wanted to give a stern warning to them to cease from their rejection of him and their despising of the Father who sent him. In the swift punishment of the king that he meted out upon those who murdered his servants, and then also in the swift punishment that the king assigned to that brazen, unrobed banquet guest, Jesus' opponents listening to his parable were supposed to understand that this was some, some picture of the everlasting doom that awaited them should they persist in their rebellious ways. I told you it was a disturbing parable. But quiet and much understated in this parable are also those many fortunate persons, both bad and good, the text says, whom Jesus portrays as having ultimately received a seat at the wedding banquet of the king's son. They have come with due regard for the king. They desire to honor the son. They are intent to celebrate at the feast to which they have been invited through no merit or worthiness of their own. They don't deserve to be there. They weren't the ones originally on the invitation list, yet there they are. In contrast to the rebellious wicked in Jesus' parable, these persons are the ones in whose lives the king's good purposes find their fulfillment. They're ready to celebrate. Those happy persons represent the nameless multitude from both Israel and the nations whom the Holy Spirit through the gospel has called to faith and has kept in the faith. God's desire is that each of you be among them. Despise not, therefore, the gospel invitation of God through his servants, your pastors. When your pastors beckon in the Lord's name, heed their call as if the Lord himself were calling you. Believe and accept this, your God's invitation, and present yourselves with cheerful and obedient hearts before the Lord who loves you. That's really what God is saying to you through today's parable. He says, despise not the invitation of God that you take your place at the wedding banquet of his son, but hasten to come into God's presence. If you've been sluggish in the past to listen to the divine summons, or perhaps stubborn to obey it, or even if you have been strongly opposed to God's involvement in your life, while God's arms are still open and his patience still waiting, hurry to make right what you previously made wrong. For my friends, the baptism with which God once washed and cleansed you is all that you need to appear clean and pure before the majesty and holiness of God, since your baptism sprinkled you with the blood of Jesus. And like the king in the parable, 
God suffers himself to be insulted even by you, all in order that he may also have mercy on you when you turn again to him in repentance. Despise not, friends, despise not the invitation to confess your sins for the purpose of receiving absolution, that is, forgiveness. But speak your hearty yea and amen to all that the scriptures say also about you. For example, in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's only half, right? God gives a whole message. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, despise not the invitation to eat and drink Jesus' body and blood in the Lord's Supper, but come and do so. And if your pastors are currently teaching you the faith through catechesis, apply yourselves diligently to this instruction in God's holy word in the confidence that it will prepare you well to receive in due time Christ himself in his supper. The body and blood of Jesus are in this sacrament given to God's people as a pledge and assurance of the forgiveness of sins won for us by Christ's cross and passion. Dear friends in Christ, in conclusion, St. Paul told the Christians in Rome in chapter 15, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. This is true. So Jesus' parable, told in Holy Week about 2,000 years ago and then recorded by St. Matthew in his Gospel, chapter 22, was written for our instruction. Jesus Christ laid down his life on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead, and ascended so that he might pour out the Holy Spirit on his church for the delivery of salvation through preaching and through baptism. For all who believe. The church's gospel message is the invitation to attend the eternal wedding banquet of the Son. That banquet that has begun already now as the church gathers around the word and sacraments and that banquet which will come to its full flowering at the return of Jesus on that day when God knows, that day for which we long and the unending glorious, heavenly banquet feast. Once again then, despise not that invitation. Rather, repent and believe. All is prepared. The feast is ready. There's nothing that you need to do. God has done it all. Yes, indeed, your wedding garment, Jesus himself has woven for you on the loom of his cross. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join in confession of our faith. Please turn in the inside back cover of your hymnal. You'll find the Apostles' Creed we join to confess. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the Spirit. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly King, your Son Jesus Christ purchased the Church with his precious blood. Preserve her in the pure teaching of your word, in the right use of the sacraments, and in the unity of the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear Heavenly King, you send out your invitation that 
all who believe in your Son should take their seats at his feast. By the proclamation of your church, gather many, however evil they may be, to repent and fill your eternal banquet hall. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly King, because your Son has set us free, we are free indeed from the powers of sin, death, and the devil. That we may remain in this saving gospel, continue to give pastors who preach the gospel in its purity and administer your sacraments according to your institution. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly King, bless all families and the homes in which our people dwell. Grant grace to husbands and wives that they may fulfill their vocations to one another and to their children. Grant also that as a family, they may faithfully teach and learn the faith. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly King, keep the coming of your Son always at the forefront of heart and mind. That, subject for his sake to the fleeting powers of this world, we may live in continual godliness and the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, defend any who suffer due to war and violence. Preserve them both in body and in soul, that, awaiting the resurrection of all flesh with your Son, Jesus Christ, they would, with us, receive with glad hearts Him who will come as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, for whom we wait, you promise to wipe away the tears from all faces. Bless Daryl Axtell, Steve Foster, Edna Bornstein's son, Robin George, Jeremy Brown, Carmody Catlin, Eldred Gerhold, Dwayne Goodwin, Alice Grisham's cousin, Wilma, Alice Hoffmeyer and her sister, Jan, Chris Rozelle's brother, Bill, and her cousins, Jeff and Sandra, Mackenzie Kelly's mother, Duska, Don Mater, Bill Rozelle, Vera Rowley, Jerry Sanders, Carol Stellwagen, Michael Ty, and Bobby Wilkinson's nephew, Steve, and all who weep here, that at the last they may be comforted, restored, and received into the banquet of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, you have prepared a table before us in the midst of those who refuse your invitation. Keep your church unstained by the world, that we may partake of the Lord's Supper worthily, clothed in his baptismal grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly King, give us such joy in pursuing what is true, just, pure, and worthy of praise that, spurning the temptations of this world, we would suffer no anxiety. Let our trust be placed fully in Christ, and let our hope rest in the life of the world to come. Through, Jesus, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the offering. I believe now it's the time for the children to come forward. Thank you, parents, for getting your child here this morning. And thanks to all who either brought food or prepared food. There is a hot continental breakfast downstairs. And after that, Sunday school for all ages. So please take advantage of all of that. We're going to sing a selection of numbers that we've been putting together since school started in general music. And we've just kind of strung them together in one presentation of praise.
we continue with the Lord's Prayer, I invite you to rise as we pray. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, God of all concord, it is your gracious will that your children on earth live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all those who would stir up violence and strife. Destroy the weapons of those who delight in war and bloodshed. And according to your will, end all conflicts in the world. Teach us to examine our hearts, that we may recognize our own in inclination toward envy, malice, hatred, and enmity. Help us, by your word and spirit, to search our hearts and to root out the evil that would lead to strife and discord, so that in our lives we may be at peace with all people. Fill us with zeal for the work of your church and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can bring that peace which is beyond all understanding. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.